Alright, the first book I read this and finished this month is Burial Rites by Hannah Kent. This is a story, and I believe I saw this book on Emily from Arc Schooling's channel. And I immediately went to my library and requested it. But um, this is a story of a young woman condemned to death in Iceland in the early 1800s, I think. Yeah, 18, late 1820s. And so they're in Iceland and she is found guilty of a murder and is sentenced to death in Iceland. And what they do is they send her to a farm to await execution. And it's, it bounces back from her thoughts to um, a more broad range of ideas, you know, what's going on around. So it's first person, third perspective. It goes back and forth um, between that. And um, because of that, it was um, a little bit hard to read at times because it gives um, her perspective. Her name is Agnes. It goes from her thoughts each chapter opens up with something related to the case and something like that. So what happens is she gets sent to this farm. It has a mother, father, and two children and she's sent um, to stay with them. And at first one of the daughters takes to her, the other one doesn't, the mom's leery. And then the mom warms up to her, and then I think throughout the whole book, um, you're kind of understanding the father's perspective. Um, and then as she's very um, kind of standoffish, she doesn't share more. This is not a Christian fiction. Um, there is a lot of because Iceland was more Puritan based is what I would call it. It wasn't really um, Protestant, it was more Puritan. Puritans tend to have a very strict um, way of living and everybody had to follow, um, you know, be in good standing and they had um, like visits for how, okay, how well are you on the catechism, very scarlet letter-ish type of feeling. And um, so there's a lot of that, but it's not Christian fiction because later on in the book, there are some details that I really didn't need to know. Um, there's like a page or two of more explicitness and it's just, bleh, bleh. you know me, I don't like that kind of stuff. So it was a lot of kind of flipping through as quickly as I could, skimming as much as, or as little as I could. But so there is that to um, think about. There is terms... There is what I would call language. They use it, I think, in the in the correct sense. Um, but I did have a couple of times where I was like, you know, thinking back on books from this, what would have been from this time era. I don't think they called it that, um, but we would call it that today. So there's, you know. A word for urinate. Um, she is an illegitimate daughter, so there's that story, and then there's that terminology. So there's there is language in here, and then there is some f bombs. Which again, I was just like, I don't think that for this time period, those type of terms would be used, which kind of takes. A little bit away from the historical aspect and I really don't like it when authors do that. I really wish it would have been a little bit more authentic in terms of terminology. Um, the, 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 the urinating stuff didn't bother me as much like it, I still kind of grimaced a little bit but it didn't bother me as much as the love triangle that gets involved and then some of the name calling that's thrown back and forth. Um, there, the F bomb is just thrown in here. That kind of bothered me a little bit more, especially due to the fact of the time period. But, um, in the end, I really did enjoy this book and it was really good. I think I'm giving it four stars on Goodreads. I haven't written that yet. Um, and I have a couple things that I was going to, to share with you with this. I don't want to talk forever about it. But um, what I took away most was throughout the whole book, Agnes is 
just portrayed as a strong woman that just gets in and does what is right and good and true. And you're kind of seeing her character through that, especially when she is said to be this heartless murderess and um, the whole um, prejudices against um, illegitimate children is definitely portrayed in here. Of course, it isn't the parents' fault. It is the children's fault, which has always just irritated me. But they, um, throughout this whole book, she is so strong and she does what needs to be done despite what people think of her. And then at the end, so this is like based on a true story about the last people that were executed in Iceland. So you already know the story. You already know what's going to happen at the end. So, but again, like throughout this whole book, she's so strong, but at the end, you just see this young girl, and she is young, so she's, um, the mom kind of takes her under wing as one of her own children, so she is young. Um, I think because she isn't married, they considered her old as a spinster kind of thing. But she, you just see her youngness just crumble and how scared she is of what's to come, and it's so heart-wrenching, and it it's beautiful, and it's ugly, and it was really well done. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm really glad that I got to read this. I did walk away from this with just a lot on my mind, and dealing with a lot um, again, the whole love triangle thing, it wasn't something that I was particularly, you know, I don't gravitate towards those things. One of the things that she does is she requests a particular reverend, and then you kind of learn more about why later on, but this is something that I thought was beautiful that was said in here, and I'm just going to give you a little peek of that. You have to understand, Reverend, that the only thing I know about my mother are what people have told me. Mainly what she did, which you'll understand they didn't approve of. Could you tell me what you were told? Agnes shook her head. To know what a person has done and to know what a person is are very different things. Toady persisted. But Agnes, actions speak louder than words. Actions lie, Agnes retorted quickly. Sometimes people never stood a chance in the beginning, or they might have made a mistake. When people start saying things like, she must have been a bad mother because of that mistake. When Toadie said nothing in response, she went on, It's not fair. People claim to know you through the things you've done, not by sitting down and listening to you speak for yourself. No matter how much you try to live a godly life, if you make a mistake in this, in this valley, it's not forgotten. No matter if you try to do what is best, no matter if your innermost self whispers, I am not as you say. How other people think of you determines who you are. I thought that was um, just really beautiful and it really just stuck with me. Like I'm really just, I read that yesterday and it still is sticking with me about it. Um, basically because I am a Christian and I get caught in that trap so much of, yeah, I, I get it, um, but I see both sides. So actions kind of reflect some of this, but people are put into a situation where they act and they're judged for it, but if they don't act, they're judging for it. They're judged for it. So again, it was just something that I really um, was thinking about and contemplating about. And I love what she said, if people would just sit and listen to me. Um, and I don't think, I don't think it's all about making excuses for behavior. I think it's, hey look, this is my side. This is what you've put me in this position and now I act in the in the way that I can only do so because of my position and then you judge me for it. And I kind of think of our teens in today's world where they're in a similar boat. They are put in these positions and then they're judged for it. So again, there was just so much thinking behind that that I, I still am doing now. Another part that I had bookmarked and I don't think it was as powerful to me as the first one but again it was just I really thought it showed a lot of who she was and I share these things so you can kind of get an idea of what to expect in this book um, but but I thought this was um, pretty relevant after an incident happens the Reverend is coming and he's talking to her and he's like you know they they pity you 
And so that's kind of where this is going in. And she's like, you're wrong, she hissed. They don't pity me. They hate me. All of them. Blondel especially. But what about Friedrich? Are they appealing his sentence too? I don't believe so. Agnes' eyes glistened in the shadow. Toadie thought she might be crying. But when she leaned closer, he saw that her eyes were... I'll tell you something, Reverend. All of my life, people have thought I was too clever. Too clever by half, they say. And you know what, Reverend? That's exactly why they don't pity me. Because they think I'm too smart. Too knowing to get caught up in this by accident. But Siga is dumb and pretty and young and that is why they don't want to see her die. She leaned back against the post, her eyes narrowed. I'm sure that's not true, the Reverend said, trying to soothe her. If I was young and simple-minded, do you think everybody would be pointing a finger at me? No, they blame it on Friedrich, saying he overpowered us, forced us to kill Nathan because he wanted his money. That Friedrich desired a little of what Nathan had is no great secret. But they see I've got a head on my shoulders, and believe a thinking woman cannot be trusted. Believe there's no room for innocence, and like it or not, Reverend, that is the truth of it. I thought you didn't believe in truth, dared Tootie. Agnes lifted her head off the post and stared at him, her eyes paler than ever. She grimaced. I have a question for you. Speaking of truth, you say God speaks the truth? Always. And God says, thou shall not kill? Yes, Toadie said carefully. Then Blondel and the rest are going against God. They're hypocrites. They say they're carrying out God's law, but they're only doing the will of men. Agnes, I try to love God, Reverend. I do. But I cannot love these men. I, I hate them. She said these last three words through clenched teeth, gripping the chain that connected the irons at her wrist. I, I found that moving. I found that powerful, especially with um, a lot of what we're dealing with today with the one side of the church being so just anything goes and the other side being so strict that... Like she said, they're not following the will of God. They're following what they want, what they expect to see. And again, it just really made me think. And I know it's very spiritual, but uh, that's that's who I am. And so it's just, it's got me thinking. But I th really thought that that really showed that throughout this whole book, some of the stuff that she's really struggling with. And again, throughout the whole book, there's so many good things, but those were two that just really... I don't know where it cut off, but um, again, would I recommend this? It just depends on where you are and what kind of um, stuff you do or do not like to read because this does have sexual content and some language. That is something to keep in mind before picking it up to read. Um, it was challenging to me as a Christian, especially when you think about what the Puritans kind of dealt with, um, some of the legalistic viewpoints of us in modern times. And just some other things. I, I can't really share too much because it would um, almost give away some of the story. But, like, part of me is she made her own bed. Now she's got a lie in it. And the other part of me is, wow, she was really put in a situation where um, sink or swim. You know, um, if you swim, you're a witch and you're going to get your head cut off. If you think you died and you proved you weren't a witch, you know, kind of that mentality. So, again, it was really, really good. I really liked it. I would like to read this again some other time. I, I think this is something that I would pick up again and really enjoy later on. So, that's my review for this. I hope it was um, enjoyable for you. And um, so, let's talk about the next book that I read. The next book that I finished was Lasting Love by Alistair Begg. This is obviously one that I picked up from the thrift store due to the blue sticker. Stuff like that annoys me when I'm showing things but it doesn't annoy me while I'm reading them. This, I love Alistair Beck. I have loved him since I was a teenager. I was that 14 year old girl. I always say 14 but really it's, it's just, I, I guess 14 was just a turning point in my maturity life and everything is now 14. But I would turn the radio on and I loved listening to his Scottish Brogue. It was probably not the content, but the narrator that I that drew me to Alistair Begg. But um, even since then, like if I miss church on Sunday, I will pull up an Alistair Begg. This one, Lasting Love, How to Avoid Marital Failure. I really enjoyed this book. This really isn't one 
that you have to read like if your marriage is failing um the subtitle how to avoid marital marital failure it, it doesn't even have to to work as a manual to avoid marital failure it's just a really good marriage book on basically what marriage is biblically supposed to look like um biblically how everything works together it kind of goes through different um obviously key points of the bible you know we're talking first peter we're talking ephesians 5 and i i just i really like alistair begg's firm but gentle way of delivering everything he nails it on the head but you don't feel beat down so much that um you can't pick up and then continue on I just really like him. Again, I, I love his content. He does the Truth For Life, so you can check him out. I know he's got videos on YouTube, so if you haven't heard of him before, go ahead and check him out. Listen to some of his stuff on YouTube. Some of the points that he's going to hit on is how to remain sexually faithful to your mate, how singles can recognize good qualities in a prospective mate, biblical guidelines for maintaining a lasting love, listening to each other, being imaginative and daring and displaying your affection. Yeah, that one we kind of just getting over it's not that it's wrong it's just not us we love Jane Austen let's keep it pure and simple and nobody needs to see what's going on we'll kind of make little gestures we'll kiss but that's that's it okay even yeah, we're gonna stop there so again I really like this I gave it four stars and I will be reading it again five stars because honestly if given the two ch the choice between two books of parenting on my shelf which one would I recommend more, Sacred Parenting or um, Lasting Love? Always, always, always Gary Thomas's Sacred Marriage. I love it. Uh, the subtitle to that is, Is Marriage Supposed to Make You Holy or Happy? And I, and I love it. Okay, so the next book that I finished was The Black Arrow by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is part of my Read the Classics Challenge for the year. I have a video on this that I shared with you, all the books that I'm going to read. It'll be linked above. And this one um, is my husband's copy. Unfortunately, as I open the pages, everything just kind of comes crumbling out. So it's held by rubber band right now. Um, but this one, I gave it three stars. And the reason for that is I felt like I was reading someone's retelling of Robin Hood. Like it didn't, um, it wasn't, I don't know how to describe it. I just didn't enjoy it as much. The language was a little bit difficult. It was kind of um, like reading... Shakespeare but not in a theater setting so it flows in, in, a, in a novel setting and it was a little bit difficult to get into um the the story is between the roses in the days of the war of the roses and uh, treason and treachery so Dick Richard his name is Dick in here and it and you do end up calling him Dick because then there's another Richard which is like the one trying to take over and be in control and I don't remember last names because I'm not English and so stuff like that didn't matter to me. Um, but Dick basically has a loyalty to his uncle, I think it's his uncle. But in, in, regard, in regards to one of the Lancaster top people, Lancasterian or Lancaster, and I just remember Lancaster because we have a town nearby and it worked with that. So he um, has a loyalty to him and the Black Arrow is now killing off all these people, basically avenging Dick's father's death. And then Dick starts questioning what's going on that, um, in, in questioning the, his loyalty to them. You know, are they loyal to the true York or he, so it's Lancaster and York and he's like, are you loyal um, to the right person, did you really conspire, were all these people really in a conspiracy against my father, if not, why is this guy killing, and then, um, he ends up saving a boy who ends up being a girl, I don't know if that tells you too much, but basically, as you can see, and then these arrows, um, kind of represent, um, the, the outlaw gang, and he ends up joining them, Robin Hood, so then, um, then he starts fighting for York and the maid, maiden's hand who then is promised to another one because of the, um, like class and try to get everybody, you know, involved in each other so that there's, um, strength of bond. So she becomes a pawn and then there's like the two, um, sides, the Lancasterians and Yorks, they're fighting who's going to be in control. It ends happily ever after, but it it just felt like the Black Arrow. Um, he gets knighted after Richard sees that he's been proven faithful. So again, 
it, because of that, I think it was a little bit harder for me to enjoy. Just there's there's a, it would be like reading a someone's retelling of Pride and Prejudice. The the original is going to be my favorite. It's not that I maybe dislike that one, but the the uh, main one is going to be my favorite. And it kind of felt that way with the Black Arrow. It was good. I enjoyed it. I probably won't read it again for some time, maybe like when the kids are older or in teens, because it will be a hard to read aloud because of the language. Um, I think it would be a great movie to watch, but insofar as reading classics, I have the others that I've enjoyed more. But it was a, it was a fun tale. It was definitely Robert Louis Stevenson's style. You could tell that he really had the child in mind for this one. And C.S. Lewis said, you know, a, a great book is going to be enjoyed not only by the children, but by an adult as well. And it was enjoyable. Again, once I got into it and I could understand the language and I could get that flow going. Um, but it was a little bit of a stumbling for me. So, um, Black Arrow, it got me, it get, I gave it three stars. So, now. Okay, so another book I finished is called The Boy Who Dared, a novel based on the true story of a Hitler youth. This one is by Susan Campbell Bartoletti. Bartoletti. She is a Newbery Honor author. This is not a Newbery winner book, however. All right, so this one was really hard. Um, if you know anything like Anne Frank, it kind of felt like that at the beginning. You know he's on death row, and you know he's going to die. And what he does is he has like this present time of like reflections or something that he's doing within prison or hearing. And then you get a glimpse of something that triggers a memory in the past, like how it led up to this point. And this I think was a really good story just to show that courage and bravery and all of those qualities that we think that we would have um, they they would be tested and they're tested awfully and even if you think you can withstand it and think that you can defy it, it it's not as simple as just willpower and it's it, it's heart-wrenching to know what they went through this is actually a Mormon perspective he was um, a Mormon um, German. Ew. So he was a Mormon German because um, there's some references there to certain brother, um, another brother German, and he's not a brother, he's just a brother within the church. And some of the stuff that that person went through, like you just start realizing to the extent of what Hitler would go, how far Hitler would go. Um, one of the things about this book that you really get to see is kind of a different perspective in a way that it starts off with being really um, in support of Hitler fixing what the Great War, you know, messed up for the German people. And then they are talking about, like... Uh, how they're educated and how, and how the youth um, are now the great going to become the great nation and why they have to put so you can kind of see like how Hitler just put little like coins in a pot that made you believe that everything was so much better than it really was and he starts figuring it out anyway he kind of figures out that Hitler isn't as great as um, everybody is making him out to be and then he's starting to really realize that Hitler is deceiving the people and he is wrong and he is a tyrant. And he wants to do something to change this. And so that's kind of what leads up into where he is today. Um, the best part of the book is actually the afterword where the author basically shows how he wrote this story. So he actually interviews and there's pictures of like Helmholtz. Helmholtz? Yeah, Helmuth, um, family, um, some of the history that happened during and after the war. Um, that, I think, just really solidified what the author did and some of the liberties that uh, she took, which, honestly, I think they were pretty um, low liberties. Do you know what I mean? Like, she didn't try to um, create this mountain out of a molehill to make it sensationalized. 
So it was really, really good. I probably will not give this to my son right now, who is a World War II, just, he loves it. I probably wouldn't give it to him right now, just because it's, it, it is difficult. It is a difficult read. And while I love to give my son stuff that would spark and inspire, um, doing hard things this this content might be a little difficult i don't want to grow him up too quickly so anyway i i really liked it this will end up staying on our shelves um i had seen this on amazon i had wanted it and then i found it for two dollars at our um, used bookstore so that was fantastic and then um it will be staying on our shelf so that's another one i finished all right i have one more book that i finished this month and I literally finished it the night of September 30th, so I am including it. And that is the mix-up files of Mrs. Basil E. And I do this every time. <laughs> I keep wanting to say Basil Rathbone. Some of you will get that out there. I know not all of you will, but it's funny, okay? But from the, from the mixed-up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frank Weiler. And this is a Newberry Medal. This is the story of a young girl named Claudia and her brother Jamie who decide that they're underappreciated and they're going to run away. But they're going to be clever and they're actually going to run away to the New York Metropol Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they end up living there for like a week and um, they, Jamie is kind of a... Um, money tight wad and so he's kind of in control of the money so that they can survive they're hiding there they're going to just learn all they can about everything that's in there I mean it's an educational homeschoolers dream they're not homeschool but anyway um, it was a really cute and sweet book I really really enjoyed it um, this author kind of has me <sighs> Like, I, I tend to either like her or I don't. Like, I wouldn't mind my kids hearing this or reading it. And I think even times, like, their little um, squabbles, it didn't bother me. Um, there was, I guess there's been a couple of motion, motion pictures made out of this. I better find them. There wasn't anything in here that I didn't want my daughter to read. And I really appreciate books like that. It wasn't great, though. Like, if she never reads it, I'm going to be okay with that. I don't think she's going to miss anything out. That's going to be her problem. It's on the shelf if she wants it. Um, actually, I'll be honest. I'm just going to donate this. I'll ask if she wants to read it. And if she wants to read it within the next couple of weeks, that's fine. In a couple of weeks, it's just going to be donated. Because it wasn't... It was kind of Maniac McGee. It was, it was just okay. It wasn't great. And there's a bunch of great books that I'm going to keep on my shelf if she decides later on she wants to read it it's a newberry medal which means she'll be able to find it at the library easily so i hope that's a good enough review i will try to leave um a goodreads review up within 24 hours of you seeing this video um, i'll just put it on my to-do list i'll try to make sure it's a priority um if not go ahead and just if you follow me on there you'll see my review when i do get it up so anyway I probably am going to give it like three stars. Again, a lot of times when I'm reviewing books, it's my own personal thoughts. I'm not trying to give like this objective review. It's my homeschool mom book nerd personal views on it. So I know a ton of people love this book. And I think the adventure is kind of a little similar to the Boxcar Children. Um, I kept thinking of that. Um, when I was reading this, but again, it wasn't the most brilliant thing I've ever read. So anyway, that's going to be it for this month. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoy these book reviews as much as I enjoy making them and reading and then sharing it with you. So until next time, have another cup of coffee and read another chapter. Bye.